And the first presenter, who has 20 minutes to present, right, is uh, Nicholas Amberg from the Severities Risk Bank, and he'll talk about the dynamic credit constraints theory and evidence from credit lines. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so this paper is joint work with uh, Tori Jacobson and Anna Rogantini from the Riggs Bank and Vincenzo Quadrini from the University of Southern California. And the starting point for this paper is a set of stylized facts about firms' access to and use of credit lines that we document using basically the Swedish Anna Credit, so a, a credit register that comprises nearly every corporate loan extended by Swedish banks uh, since 2019. And I guess many of you already know what a credit line is, but for those of you who don't, let me explain. So a credit line is a type of bank loan in which a bank sets a limit for the firm, and the firm can then borrow as much as it wants to as long as it stays under the limit. So it can increase and decrease borrowing over time as it sees fit, but it always has to remain below the limit. And the firm pays a fixed fee for the maintenance of, of this facility as a whole, but interest only on the amount that it is actually drawing at any given point in time. And I can also mention that, that credit lines are the most common type of corporate loan extended by banks, and outside of the real estate sector, they also account for the majority of the aggregate volume of bank lending to firms. So that's what credit lines are. Uh, and, and on to our stylist facts. Um, so the first stylist fact relates to what I just said, and that is that credit lines are widespread and sizable. So if you look at the left figure here, what we do here is to take all non-financial firms in the Swedish economy, we sort them according to, into 11 size bins according to their net assets. So we have the smallest firms on the left and the largest firms on the right. And what the figure then shows is the share of firms, firms in each size bin that has at least one credit line from a bank. And what we see then is that about half of all Swedish non-financial firms have a credit line, and this is true throughout the size distribution. So credit lines are very common. So they're also sizable. Uh, the right figure here shows the average ratio of committed amount to assets in each of the size bins. So the committed amount, that's the limit on a credit line, so the amount of borrowing capacity that the firm is granted. And, and this is the ratio of that to, to assets. And this is an average about 15% in the sample as a whole, um, which, which is to say that you know, credit lines provide firms with an economically meaningful amount of borrowing capacity. If you look over the size distribution, you see that it is, if anything, slightly decreasing, which is to say that relative to the size of their assets, smaller firms, if anything, have slightly larger credit lines than, than bigger firms. The second fact is that credit lines are not heavily used, and especially not by SMEs. So the left figure here shows the average utilization rate in each of the size bins, and the utilization rate is defined as the drawn amount divided by the committed amount, so the share of the credit line that a firm is actually using at a given point in time. This is about 25% in the sample as a whole, uh, and it's strongly increasing over the size distribution, so going from about 20% in the bottom to just under 40% in the top. So large firms draw about twice as much on their credit lines as do small firms. Uh, kind of the, the, the flip side of the fact that credit lines are sizable but not heavily used is that firms have access to substantial amounts of undrawn borrowing capacity via credit lines. And this we can see in the right figure here, which shows the average ratio of undrawn amount to assets in each size bin. Uh, and this is about 10% on average. We can also relate, relate the size of the undrawn amount to the firm's labor costs. If we do that, we find that the undrawn amount on average equals more than three times the firm's monthly wage bill. And, and this is also uh, decreasing over the size distribution, going from about 13% in the bottom to, to about 5% in the top. So, you know, the, the average firm that has a credit line could substantially expand the size of its operation simply by drawing on credit that it has already been granted but, it, but is not currently using. <clears throat> Third fact is that credit lines are not prohibitively expensive. So the left figure here shows the average interest rate on the drawn amount on credit lines during our sample period. Uh, it's about 3.5% on average, and it's declining over the size distribution, going from 4.5% in the bottom to just over 2% in the top. So what this shows is that credit lines are, are fairly affordable, even for the smallest firms that pay the highest rates. And, and of course, you know, what do we mean when we say that it's low? Well, one, one comparison is to, to, to uh, well, one thing you can do is to compare it to the firm's return on equity. And in the right panel here, 
I show the median return on equity in each of the size bins. And what we see is that you know, the interest rates are, are way below the return on equity in all of the, the size bins. So credit lines are affordable. And those are the three facts. There, there are five in the paper, by the way, but I've compressed them into three here for the sake of presentation. So if we keep all of this, this in mind, uh, or first, well, just to sum up what we learned. Uh, so basically two things. The first is that firms throughout the size distribution have access to fairly large and reasonably priced unused borrowing capacity via credit lines. The second is that SMEs hold more unused credit line borrowing capacity than large firms when measured relative to the size of their assets. So now, if we take a step back and think about what this means for credit constraints. So as all of you know, of course, there is a huge literature in economics and finance that holds that credit constraints are an important and widespread impediment to firms' ability to develop and grow, and that this is particularly true for certain groups of firms, such as small firms and young firms. And, and what we mean when we say that a firm is credit constrained, well, if you take theoretical models featuring credit constraints, you can broadly speaking divide them into two classes. So on the one hand, you have models in which a firm faces a, a well-defined limit to how much it can borrow. And you know, if that limit is binding, then the firm is constrained, otherwise not. And the degree of constraint is captured by the Lagrange multiplier on the firm's borrowing constraint, which of course is zero if the limit is not binding, and otherwise it's positive. And the more positive it is, the more constrained is the firm. In the other class of models, you know, firms don't face a strict limit to how much they can borrow, but um, the cost of borrowing is increasing in the amount of, of debt the firm takes on, for example, because of the higher default risk that, that more debt entails. And in these models, the, the, the degree of credit constraint facing a firm is determined by its marginal cost of borrowing. But what I showed you just now with these facts is that, you know, at least among firms that have a credit line, and, and they are numerous, as we saw, uh, for these firms, you know, they're generally far from their borrowing limits, which implies that the Lagrange multiplier and their borrowing constraints is zero, and they do not face particularly high marginal costs of borrowing. And that, of course, then begs the question, is this common view consistent with the basic facts? You know, are credit constraints actually widespread? Is it, do we have reasons for thinking that small firms are, in general, more constrained than large firms? And our answer to this question is going to be, or to all of these questions, is going to be yes. So we think that the, the common view is correct. We think that credit constraints are widespread. We think that there are good reasons for thinking that small firms usually are more credit constrained than large firms. But what we argue is that to reach that conclusion, you have to adopt a concept of credit constraints that differs a little bit from the ones that are typically applied in the literature. And we're going to call this concept dynamic credit constraints and argue that Firms are very often dynamically constrained, but much less often constrained in a, in a simple static sense. So <clears throat> if you bear with me for a minute, I'll explain exactly what we mean by this. So in the second part of the paper, we develop this idea of dynamic credit constraints using a very, very simple but, but fully dynamic model of a firm's borrowing decision. Um, and in this model, we have a firm that produces output using labor. And the model has three key ingredients. So the firm faces first uh, collateral constraint. So it can borrow up to a fraction xi of its expected next period cash flow. It faces uncertainty about both its next period productivity, said, and its next period access to external finance, as captured by this parameter xi. And thirdly, the firm faces costly financial distress, which is to say that it must raise costly emergency funds if the debt that it chooses today, tomorrow, turns out to be too high. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by too high. And what these features together generate is an intertemporal trade-off for the firm, in which the firm trades off the benefits of higher borrowing today against the risk of becoming illiquid tomorrow, which is costly. And as a consequence of this, a firm may choose to stay below its borrowing limit for precautionary reasons. And before I move on here, I mean, I just want to say that this is a super simple model all the ingredients in it already exist in more you know, elaborate models in the literature. And you know, you'll recognize that this is very similar to, for example, buffer stock models of, of consumption on the household side. So, so in that sense, there's, there's really nothing new. But we still find this, this, this uh, model formulation useful. And, and one of the things that we find it useful for is that it allows us to, in an intuitive and clear manner, distinguish these two concepts of credit constraints. You know, the, on the one hand, static credit constraints, which correspond to the Lagrange multiplier on a firm's borrowing constraint, or its current marginal cost of borrowing, 
And on the other hand, we have the dynamic credit constraints, which are correspond to the expected marginal cost of borrowing, which is the current marginal cost plus the marginal expected distress cost. Uh, and I mean, we, we, labels aren't important as such, but you know, we, we call this dynamic because in, in this dynamic concept of credit constraints, we incorporate the expected costs of binding credit constraints in the future you know, into the very measure of credit constraints itself, and that's why we label it dynamic. And just one of the key properties then of this model is that low credit line utilization among firms is a sign not that the firm faces slack credit conditions, but on the contrary that it faces particularly tight credit constraints. Because low credit line utilization results when the firm faces a high expected marginal cost of borrowing, which is the measure of, of credit constraints. So that's the overview. Uh, now a slight bit more detail on some of the, some parts of the model. So the firm's production technologies as follows. So output is equal, is the product of, of an idiosyncratic productivity shock Z and employment N. Uh, hiring is subject to an, a strictly increasing and convex adjustment cost, which ensures, ensures that the optimal size of the firm is determined at, at every point in time. And the center part of, of, of the model then is the, is the firm's borrowing decision. And the key elements in this borrowing decision uh, are as follows. So in each period, firm chooses, the firm chooses its next period debt subject to this collateral constraint. So the debt cannot exceed a fraction xi of its next period cash flow. But when the firm makes its decision, xi and z are not yet realized. So the collateral constraint ne needs to hold based on the expectation of these variables. So the firm makes its choice. And then in the next period, uh, xi and z are realized. Uh, and now the collateral constraint needs to hold based on the realized values of these variables. Uh, and and what, so, so the, what this means is that the firm ends up insufficiently collateralized if the debt exceeds the realized fraction xi of the realized cash flow. If the debt becomes insufficiently collateralized, uh, the firm is forced to raise emergency funds, and the cost of, of, of doing so is given by this function phi. So it has to sort of cover for the excess debt, and the cost of doing so is given by the parameters kappa and, and eta. So the expected cost of borrowing for a firm then is the marginal interest cost plus the marginal expected future distress cost, which is the expectation of, of the derivative of this function phi. Okay, so if we illustrate this, this borrowing decision that the firm then, then makes, in the left-hand case, just as the baseline case, we exclude the distress costs. So we assume that the distress costs do not exist. Then it's very simple, you know, we have the marginal benefit of debt, the blue line, marginal cost of debt, the red line, both are constant, and as long as debt is cheaper than equity, marginal benefit of debt is, equal, is higher than the marginal cost, and the firm always borrows up to the limit. But then add the distress cost. What happens now is that the marginal cost of debt becomes an increasing function of, uh, um, uh, of debt, uh, because now the more debt the firm takes on, the higher is the expected distress cost. And this leads the firm to stay below its borrowing limit. Um, and and this, is kind of, this, this is what we mean when we say that the firm would be dynamically constrained, because this is a firm that chooses to stay below its borrowing limit, not because it faces a high interest rate, but because the expected cost, total expected cost of borrowing is high. So to be able to go to the data and, and try to assess if firms are indeed dynamically constrained, we need some good testable predictions. And we derive two testable predictions from the model. So the first is that provided that this distress cost is sufficiently high, then we have that an increase in uncertainty about either future access to credit or productivity leads a firm to reduce borrowing and real activity. So this is illustrated in this figure here. So what happens is that when uncertainty goes up, then you know, the expected distress cost for any given level of borrowing increases, which means that you know, the, marginal, the total marginal cost of debt increases, and the firm then, then reduces its borrowing as a consequence. The other testable prediction is that an increase in a firm's credit limit leads it to increase borrowing and real activity, even if it had not exhausted its borrowing capacity prior to the increase. So what we illustrate here in this figure is that you know, when, when the limit is, is increased, shifted out, the marginal cost of debt decreases. Because with a higher debt limit, uh, the expected distress cost for any given level of debt falls. 
and the firm responds to this by increasing that. So I've deliberately drawn this figure so that the firm, you know, after the limit increase, it, it increases its debt, but, but that, that increase could have been achieved even before, which is that the firm chose to, to, to not do it because of the uh, expected costs involved in doing so. So those are our two testable predictions uh, that we take to the data. Uh, so in the, yeah, that's what we do in the final part of the paper. Uh, just a quick word on the data first. Uh, so what we do, what we use in this paper is, is a credit register called Krita. It's the Swedish correspondent of, of ECB's Anna Credit. We have detailed loan level information at monthly frequency covering 95% of the volume of corporate loans extended by Swedish banks. And there's no lower size threshold for a loan to be included in this database. So we have nearly the universe of loans. We complement this with, with you know, standard financial accounts and, and other firm level data that covers the universe of Swedish incorporated firms. And then we select a sample that comprises all non-financial firms that have at least 5 million kronas, so that's about 500,000 euros, in net assets and annual sales, and at least five employees, just to make sure that we only have like, economically meaningful enterprises in, in the sample. And then we aggregate up the, 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 the loan level data to the firm month level. Uh, for month level data throughout the empirical analysis. And since time is short, I'm not going to go into detail on these tests. Uh, I'm just going to explain in words what we do. So the first testable Im implication that we take to the data is that when uncertainty about future credit access goes up, utilization rates and credit lines go down. Our proxy for uncertainty about future credit access is the maturity of a firm's credit lines. And the idea here is that during the lifespan of a firm's credit lines, they have a degree of certainty about both the price and quantity of borrowing available to it. Not, not perfect because of covenants and other things, but, but a degree of certainty. But as soon as a firm's credit lines mature, both the price and the quantity is subject to renegotiation, which creates uncertainty. So all else equal, longer credit line maturities implies that the firm faces less uncertainty about, about future access to credit. So what we do is just to regress credit line utilization rate on credit line maturity while controlling for lots of things. And what we find is that firms with short maturity credit lines, meaning below one year, on average have 40 percentage point lower utilization rates than firms with long maturity credit lines, which is a very substantial difference. The second test, or the second uh, prediction that we take to the data is, is that Productivity uncertainty or cash flow uh, uncertainty uh, is also, uh, you know, higher, higher cash flow uncertainty is, is, uh, leads to um, lower utilization rates. What we do here is simply to, to, to follow standard practice in the literature to, to compute industry level measures of cash flow volatility. And then we regress utilization rates on, on these industry level measures. And what we find then is that firms that operate in the most in the industries characterized by the highest cash flow volatility, uh, on average, utilize their credit lines 10 percentage points less than, than firms in the least volatile industries. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we want to test if borrowing responds to changes in credit limits, and if this happens even for firms that are far from their borrowing limits at the time of the, the change in the limit. Um, so what we do here is that we regress the change in the drawn amount on a firm's credit lines on the change in the committed amount. So what such a regression tells us is, you know, if, if, if the limit is increased by one euro, then by how many cents does borrowing, actual borrowing increase? And what we do then is that we bin firms based on how much they drew on their credit lines at the time of the, of the change in the credit line. And then we see how the response varies over the, by, by the, with these bins. And what we find is that for every, well, let's say every euro increase in, in, in a firm's credit limit, borrowing increases by 17 cents for firms that are the furthest from the limit, by 34 cents for firms that are in the middle of the utilization distribution, and by about 70 cents for firms that are close to, to the limit. So this thing that, you know, even firms that are very far from their borrowing limits, um, uh, response to a, to, a, to a change in the limit is consistent with this idea that firms are dynamically constrained. Um, so to wrap up, uh, we use a comprehensive Swedish credit register to show that statically binding credit constraints are relatively common, even among SMEs, 
We argue that the data is nevertheless consistent with credit constraints being widespread once we understand them in this dynamic sense. And then finally, we take the predictions of the model to the data and show that many firms indeed behave as if they are constrained in this sense. So, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for perfect timekeeping. <laughs> so uh, now, Frederic Malef is uh, from the University College London is going to discuss. Can I get the clicker, please? Oh, yes. There. Just one second. I'm going to. That's me. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I have to find you. Um, just bear with me. No, he's in the PowerPoint. Ah, yes, it's true. Yes. Exactly, yes. yes, yes. You are in the PowerPoint. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and thanks very much. So, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that I think that credit lines are an understudied uh, topic in the literature, so that's great to have a paper on this. And I also think that there should be more papers mixing theory and empirics, so that's the second reason why uh, you should uh, read the paper. The third one is that um, there are fascinating stylized facts. Well, they've been very well uh, summarized, so maybe you don't need to read the paper for that, but uh, they, are <coughs> they are valuable uh, on, their, on their own. Um, so the second part is about the theory, and that's what I will focus on, uh, which will not be a big surprise for those of you who know me. Uh, but I will focus on it really with the, um, with the goal to try to use the theory to think about the empirical tests that are, uh, that are made. So it's a parsimonious model, but let me try to show you an even more parsimonious uh, model. So I'll start with the budget constraints. Like the, the first... Um, the first one, imagine you have a firm, you can invest an amount x0, and you do that with E, that's your initial equity, and B0, this is how much you borrow to start with. Uh, next date, well, you get x0 times R1, this is just the, the proceeds from your investment, you repay your short-term debt B0 with some interest rate R0, and you can borrow a bit more uh, or a bit less. Uh, that is B1, and this is how much you have to invest in the second period, and that is X1. Second period, well, third period, uh, uh, this is the end date. You pay yourself a dividend uh, D2, and what's your dividend? This is simply the positive part of the, of the uh, value of the firm, right? You have invested X1, uh, that gives you a return, a gross return R2, and you repay your debt, and if you have enough, if there is something less, uh, this is for you, otherwise you walk away with zero. Okay, so that's extremely standard. Now, what's a technology? Let's just say that the risk-free rate um, is zero. R1 and R2 can be just either um, low or high. Of course, RH is greater than RL. It's positive in PV stuff, and the, the probability to get RH is respectively P1 and P2. Okay, let me introduce financial distress costs. Um, for most of what I do, I'll just focus on what happens at date one and assuming that uh, things did not go too badly in the first period and uh, we are in a going concern. This is just to, to simplify the exposition. So we are at date one. We want to, to borrow from um, uh, creditors. Let's assume that the debt is risky. The, the creditors need to break even in expectation. So if they give us B1, um, what will they get? Well, with probability P2, things go well and we can repay them with interest. With probability 1 minus P2, they get what is left uh, in, uh, in the firm, which is X1 times RL. But there is something less that they get, and it's the default cost, the financial distress cost. Okay, so with probability 1 minus P2, when things go badly, there is a parameter kappa, which is the same as uh, in, the, uh, in the paper. And the default costs here are just, well, it's a convex function uh, of the, the shortfall in, in the value uh, to repay the creditors, okay? So B1 is how much you have borrowed. X1 times RL, this is how much you have. If uh, you, you owe more than you have, th there's a shortfall and there's a cost to that. So this is extremely uh, standard. Now what you can do there is to solve for R1. You substitute into the constraints and everything uh, looks uh, very nice and tidy. I'll spare you the, uh, the steps, but I'll show you what it looks like. And again, I'll, uh, I'll look at uh, the date one decision. So at date one, I want to decide how much I invest. And you'll have to believe me, but once you solve for R, um, R1 and you do the substitution, this is what you get. The first part is the Modigliani and Miller surplus. Okay, so you get 
R2 bar, this is the expectation of R2 minus 1. This is the expected surplus from investment at date 1. You had some surplus in expectation from uh, carried over from date 0. E, it's your initial equity. So uh, the first part, if there wasn't financial distress costs, that would be the most boring uh, model ever. And then you have the financial distress costs, which, of course, in equilibrium, you internalize because the creators needs to need to break even. That's what we teach all our uh, students. And so the financial distress cost boiled down to, uh, to, to that term here. And um, there are two possible cases. The first one that I've shown you is if after, uh, like um, if the first period investment was low, you get an RL there. If the first period uh, return to investment was high, you just have something, uh, something more there. But let's set that aside for, uh, for now. Just take what happens as given. And in both cases, you see that there is a trade-off, right? When you increase uh, X1, you increase your Modigliani and Miller surplus, but you also uh, increase your uh, expected uh, financial distress cost. So that's uh, a very basic trade-off, and there is no need for dynamics uh, here. So that's the first point that I uh, want to, uh, to make. Second, bringing on the dynamics, um, investing at day zero is also positive in PV. And the key thing in this simple model is that it, it will allow for more equity and expectation at date one. So slightly rewriting what I had in uh, the previous slide and now looking at things from date zero perspective. So you will have that uh, with probability uh, one minus P1, you get the, 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 first, uh, um, the first line of the uh, functional distress cost and with probability P1, you get the second one. And what you see uh, when you rearrange the, the terms is that the, the, the financial uh, uh, distress cost depend on how much equity you have at the end of the first period, right? And what is it? It is your initial equity plus either the surplus or the loss that you made on the first uh, period investment. And so things are a bit different here because when you think about X0, again, there's a trade-off. The more you invest, the more you get the money, Modigliani and Miller surplus, but you have two subtle, subtle things happening there. In expectation, you get more equity at date one, which means that in expectation, you reduce the, um, uh, the financial distress cost. But of course, it's a convex function. And so you also increase the, the volatility of your equity at day two, which increases your expected financial distress cost. And because it's convex, at some point, when, once you increase x0 uh, more and more and more, the convex part dominates. And so that's why you have a, uh, an interior solution. And in a sense, that's, that's my way to, 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 to think about what is happening uh, in, uh, in, in, their, in their model. Now, a few remarks. In my model, if you play with kappa and the expectation of R2, you get very similar comparative statics to uh, what is in the paper and what leads to the, um, uh, to the empirical predictions. But then, I think the crucial question is, where are the credit lines in my model? No credit lines. But where are the credit lines in your model? There's no credit line either. So I think it's very, it's very useful to use those models to think about uh, what uh, borrowing limits are, but there is something missing uh, there. So this is, a, this is the, the, the picture that Niklas uh, showed you. To me, it just looks like the trade-off theory. And in a sense, that's what uh, my model is about. So it would be nice to have some, um, some credit lines uh, in there. So, that's just a very uh, a basic way to, to think about financial distress cost. Now, what is, the, what is the limit? You can think as the limit as the point where you have the asymptote, but once you think about credit lines, it's not how it works, right? Because credit lines are set at a given interest rate. So clearly the limit is below, is below there. And so there is, ver there is potentially something very rich to, to look at, but uh, I couldn't figure it out uh, just for the discussion. So let me conclude on, um, giving my take on the uh, empirical uh, result, given what I've just uh, told you. So the first result is the, that the utilization rate decreases with volatility of cash flows. So in a sense, borrowing is related to volatility. That's fine. It speaks to the trade-off uh, theory. But again, how shall we interpret what the committed, committed amount is? What is the borrowing limit? There, there is something uh, more to be done there. Utilization rate increases with maturity. Well, I'd like to think of the credit line as, a, as an option. And so if the credit line is currently in the money, 
From a static point of view, it's a no-brainer. You exert the, auction, uh, the, the option. But from a dynamic point of view, refinancing is an issue, right? Because if you take the, the credit line now, but it expires next period, and you have invested and now you need to refi refinance, you are in trouble. And so this is where we really have the role of irreversibility and the link with the credit line that is, that is important. Uh, but then you get into endo endogeneity issues, right? Because the maturity of the credit line is li very likely to depend on the uh, uh, irre irreversibility of the investment. And even if you control for industry, within an industry, firms are likely to self-select into long, uh, longer maturity credit lines if they are just investing in stuff which is more ir irreversible and not just day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities. And the final, uh, the final bit, the propensity to, uh, to draw uh, in, uh, on increase in borrowing limits is positive and decreasing in distance to the limits. And, and you're right that it's hard to rationalize this based on static conceptions of credit lines, which, uh, which is, uh, of credit constraints, sorry, uh, which makes sense. So the fact that it's positive is in line with the trade-off theory. So you have a model with predictions, but they are not unique, so there is something which is a little bit uh, uh, unsatisfactory there. Now that it is decreasing in the distance, I find it super interesting. But again, neither my model, not, not yours, has credit lines and can really uh, uh, get to, uh, to that fact. And that's something that I think is a, is a super interesting thing for, mm -hmm. uh, for future uh, research. And that's exactly where I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Nicholas, do you want to, to reply to add something to the comments of this question? Well, I, I just want to say, well, thank you for the comments. Uh, all were very well taken. Uh, and I will, uh, I, I will absorb them and think about them. And uh, I'm sure they will be very useful going forward. So, thanks a lot. So, thank you. OK, so the floor is yours. Any question? Comment? I, I have yes. A I don't know. Do we need as well? You can go ahead, yes, first. I think you will have a mic just coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting paper. Uh, just have one question about the uh, uh, empirical part, uh, the business cycle patterns. Uh, I guess uh, uh, these constraint firms utilization rate is low uh, in case something happens in bad times. Uh, but when something happens, uh, uh, are there, uh, uh, do they actually utilize uh, the credit lines uh, more than unconstrained firms? Yeah, uh, so another question. Mm -hmm. So, very interesting paper. Now, when I think about credit lines, and the, I mean, the relationship with financial frictions when it comes to my mind, this uh, paper of optimal long-term contracting. So the Marson Fishman have uh, this paper in which you can implement a long-term contract with uh, long-term debt and credit lines. And you can show in those models that changes in uncertainty or changes in productivity would lead to changes also in the credit limit and in the interest rate that you pay on that. And so, I'm thinking when you do the empirical strategy and take the credit limit kind of an exogenous variable with the controls. So what good thing that would, could be driven also by, by other staff, no? Because you have the, you are kind of showing the model of the borrower, but it's also mo the model of the lender, right? So. Any more comments, questions? Yes. Um, so very much related to, to Frederick's point. Um, it looks to me that uh, and the, the lender part of it is, should be there also for the outside option when the distress moment comes. Because there's the credit lines about securing a price in a, in a bad time when the potential price of alternative options are really bad. And in good times, the alternative options are there. So. Um, so it looks to me that that credit line is not the only type of credit that the firms have. Maybe it would be used to have. It would be useful for me, at least, to have in the in the stylized facts the connection between credit lines and other sources of of credit, even bank credit that you probably have in the data, to see whether there's substitution or complementarities between the two. Right. 
So now we might let Nicholas answer mm -hmm. if you want to, to add to some of the comments. Sure. So the first was about business cycle patterns and whether firms actually utilize when, when bad things happen. And, and, and in general, yes, they do. Um, but of course, it also depends on what type of shock it is. So, so something that we saw, for example, during the, the COVID pandemic was that with the exception of very large firms, uh, that, that small firms actually uh, reduced the utilization of their credit lines. Uh, but, but that may, of course, precisely be because uncertainty was exceptionally high in the pandemic. So it depends a bit on what the, what the type of the shock is. But, but certainly we see that if, the, if they're hit by a severe idiosyncratic uh, shock, then, then they do utilize their credit lines indeed. And then I think you, so your question was about the endogeneity of the credit limit and how much can we actually learn. And I mean, I, I didn't have time to go into the results now. And, and, and I should say that in, in none of these empirical tests do we have a, you know, a, a perfect natural experiment or, or the ideal instrument. So, so they should be taken as, you know, empirical regularities, let's call them. Um, but what we, what we do is just, so certainly the, the you know, changes in the credit limit can be driven both by the lender and by the borrower. And, and here it would, of course, be more problematic if, um, if um, you know, these this, this changes were initiated by the borrower. I, I mean, we're thinking of a situation where, where the lender sort of extends it, and, and then you want to see what happens. Um, so what we do is that we impose fairly tight sets of, of fixed effects to absorb as much as we can of the variation in credit demand that might, might, might drive this. But, uh, but of course, that only goes so far in, 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 in that direction. And then we had, sorry, the, uh, Victoria. Uh, Liquidity constraints. Come again? The constraints. Yes, oh, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, would you mind just repeating, Victoria? I, I, Wondering about other type of bank credit. The other type. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we've started to look a bit into this. Um, I would say that in, in general, for the, the, the typical case for a small firm at least, is that they only have credit lines. They very rarely have term loans, for example. Um, so in that sense, at least when it comes to bank funding, it is often the only source of, of bank loans for a small firm. Um, so in that sense, there isn't really much in terms of complementarity there. Um, so. Okay, so thank you very much.